quick, come in. Don't let anybody see you. What's up, guys? Welcome back to American Nostalgia Garage. Remember this thing? It needs an engine. Let's go build one. All right, guys. Our 87 Blazer needs an engine. And if you watched uh, some of our previous videos, we have a six liter that we're getting ready to put together for it. Here we are. Just a little side note, Turbski 9000. Anyway, that's a different car. But for the Blazer, it's getting this old six liter. Got some scaly rust on there we gotta knock back. We gotta do some home machining. And then uh, we got some new parts to go in that thing. So let's drag it out of the garage and get started. First thing I wanna do is knock back some of this rust. So what I'm gonna do is I got a whole bunch of uh, cheapo wire brushes, a drill, and I got my angle grinder with a another brush on there. And we're gonna give this thing hell. I wanna get it nice and clean because I actually give a crap about it. Welcome to Steve's Redneck Dentistry. I'm gonna hit the block with this wire brush on my angle grinder and get this thing nice and clean. Got my drill with some smaller, smaller brushes to hit some of the tight, tighter places. Gonna get this thing cleaned up. All right, we got it pretty clean. I ended up using a body hammer with a pick end to get in some of the tight spots where all the crusty rust was. Now we're gonna hone these cylinders. You can see they're pretty glazed. They're pretty shiny, all of them for the most part. This one's got a reflection in it. Um, they're pretty in pretty good shape, the bores, but we're gonna hone them. And we're gonna hone the lifter bores also. We have a small hone for that. Uh, and then we'll get this thing a good clean and we can get back to putting it together. So let's do a little hone job. So we're gonna use one of these dingle ball hones because they're awesome. And this one is slightly used. I borrow it from uh, my buddy, Ryan, at Automotive Chaos. This thing uh, looks like it's been run through the ringer, so we know it's gonna work. Uh, I like these because they can go in a drill. I'm gonna spin it with a drill on high speed. I'm gonna basically go up and down inside the cylinder while spraying with some WD-40. And we're gonna try to clean this up and deglaze the cylinders, get a little bit of a cross hatch going. Pretty easy stuff. All right, we got all of our bores honed and all of our lifter bores rehoned. And uh, let me show you some of the highlights and some of the low lights. So we got cylinders that look like this, pretty good. All right, you can see I don't know if you can make it out with the camera, but there's a, a nice good cross hatch in there. Don't mind this is dirty down there, but I got to clean it up. But like, eh, so here's here's some of the highlights. You got cylinders that look like this. You got other cylinders over here that look good. These actually those four look good, uh, which would be the driver side. But if you remember, this was one of our problem cylinders. That doesn't look great. This is not coming out, and that is not coming out, and that is. It's not great so this really this block really should go to the machine shop and get like bored out and then rehoned or have somebody professionally refinish it so we're not going to do that we're just going to slap it together and then pray all right so you guys know when you check in the american nostalgia garage you know you're getting precision you know so we're going to do all our machining processes right now before we go to clean this thing up and put it back together so i knocked back all the deck surfaces with a little bit of a, a brush. It's a, like a brass brush or whatever. And uh, now I'm going to take a piece of steel and some sandpaper and uh, you know try to get it a little bit flatter. The idea here is we're not really resurfacing it or milling it, we're just trying to get it down a little bit closer, get rid of some junk on there, maybe expose you know a low spot or whatever, just so we know what we're working with. So for this I'm using some box steel. I got 1,000 grit. I don't really know what sandpaper I probably, probably should be using for this. Get a little WD-40 on the paper. When you're doing this, you want to go in a crosshatch pattern like this because you don't really, you don't want to work any, you know, grooves into it. All right, so nice and fresh. That'll take a gasket. It's probably not perfectly flat, but it's perfectly garbage enough for us. So this is what we're gonna build. Now I've gotta wheel it three quarters of a mile that way to the nearest hose 
so I can clean this thing off and get ready for your building. All right, we got it all cleaned up with the hose. What I did is just to give a, the cylinder walls a final clean, I used a little ATF on a rag, cleaned up all the cylinders. Something about the detergents in it helped clean up all the oil stone, uh, all the grit and stuff like that you can't get out normally with like brake cleaner or water. Next thing I'm gonna do actually is put in cam bearings because after you put in cam bearings, I'm actually gonna start with the rotating assembly. So we're gonna do the cam bearings first. So LS cam bearings, actually pretty much any cam bearings, they have to be done with a special tool, which of course you have to buy and it's extra stuff, but kinda has to be done this way. The cam bearings in here are smoked. Otherwise, honestly, I'd probably just leave them. Um, when you buy them, most of them are different sizes. Like uh, they might taper in size all the way down or the outsides are gonna be bigger and the insides are gonna be smaller. There's like a roadmap pretty much on the box or there'll be instructions in there that'll tell you. So we know the number one and number five position are gonna take part number CH10-1. Number two and four are gonna take, take CH10-2 and number three is gonna say, take uh, CH 10 3. And then that way you basically know where each one of these cam bearings go because they're not the same size. Make sure you pay attention to that, otherwise, you'll slide your cam in after you're all ready to assemble this and the thing won't turn nicely. And then, of course, you're just going to turn it and send it anyway. We're going to knock out all the old ones and then we'll send the new ones home. All right, so a little explanation about how this cam bearing tool works. There's the side that you hit with a hammer. There's the side that the cam bearing slides onto like that. And then there's this cone piece, which slides into one of the cam bearing bores to keep this tool stable. So you don't drive it in like this or drive it in like that. So it's perfectly level. This one specifically has ends that you can remove so that when you need to get, you know, to one that's past the bearing that you may have already done. You can get in there, turn it in, screw it back on, and then you can still do what you need to do. So you can kind of do these in any order. I'm gonna do them from the inside out so I can get the ones that might be in the way done first, and then we'll just see how it goes from there. Another side note is all the bearings have a hole in them. You wanna make sure that that hole lines up with the hole in the block for where the oil hole is, and uh, that way you get oil to your cam. All right, so we're gonna do position number three first, which is right in the middle. And that's CH10-3. Gonna put some assembly lube on the back. I have number three on the tool. I have the oil hole in the bearing lined up with the oil hole in the block. I'm gonna slide this cone in so I know it's centered. And then I'm gonna drive it home. Now you've just gotta watch, you don't go all the way through. You get it centered and you're good. The last thing I'm gonna do right now, just what I wanna decide if I need to go in any further or not, I'm gonna take a pick with an angle on it. I'm gonna make sure that that hole is lined up. And if it is, then we're good. And we just gotta do the rest. All right, with our cam bearings installed, I'm gonna throw our cam in just to make sure it spins and that our cam bearings themselves are not actually installed crooked. Got a little bit of assembly lube on all these. I'm gonna put a little bit on the cam and I'm gonna slide it in. But before I do, this is our cam. It is a Texas Speed Chapa Cabra. Actually, actually, I think it's called the Chop Monster. I don't know, something to do with Bigfoot. Knock off, Sasquatch. Sam Squatch? But uh, yeah, I'm gonna clean this thing off before I throw it in because they have a lot of uh, oil and stuff that they use during the machining process that's still on here. And so, gotta be careful when you do this because you don't wanna nick any of the bearings you just set in. Once you get the cam about halfway in, you can reach into the block and kind of help it along through the bottom of the block. Since there won't be a lot sticking out here for you to grab onto. All right, we're in and it spins nice and free, just like that. See how it slides back and forth? It spins, I could spin it by hand easily. All right, so now we can take it back out. Here's a cam card for anybody that's wondering. 
All right, more bearings. We got to do mains and rods. We're going to take out our old main bearings and we're going to put our new ones in and we're going to mic them up. You can do it with plastic gauge. Uh, plastic gauge is basically a little tiny piece of filament that you throw along the crank, torque it down. It squishes based on what the clearance is. It'll squish to a certain dimension. And then you measure the width that it's squished down to using the paper that they give you and it'll have marks on it. It'll show you what the clearance is between the crank and the actual uh, main journal bearing. Uh, I happen to have a dial bore gauge, so we're gonna do it with that. Let me show you why engine building is just as much an investigative activity as it, as it is an engine building activity. So I was just going through, got the main caps off and I'm just cleaning things out. And I noticed if you look real close, uh, see if I can get the camera to focus. Right in there, there's oil. And it's coked up and it's sludge in there. And it's on at least three of them. Yeah, three of them. And there's a little on one and five also. But the middle three have it coked in there. So, you know, is it going to hurt anything? Maybe not. But if that happens to break loose and jam up one of these oil galleys, we have a problem. So, I'm going to go clean that out. Just little things to pay attention to when you're putting these things together. All right, so we got all of our main caps off. I'm going to throw in the new set all the way down, go through the torque sequence, which is a little bit weird on LS engines. It's torque all the middles to 15 foot-pounds, I think, then torque them down to 80 degrees from the starting point. And it's the same with the outers. It's uh, 15 foot-pounds and then 53 degrees. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... The, on, a, on a preliminary check that's what it looks like it is either way the point is he's got to get torqued down with the new bearings no crankshaft uh that way we have a bore to measure and then what we're going to do is we're going to mic up our crank get a measurement off of that put it in our dial bore and then get a relative measurement because what we're doing here is really it's less of a measurement and more of a relative distance between how big the crank is versus how big the main journal is basically so we know what the clearance is. I'll show you. Okay, we're inside today, because it is raining pterodactyls and beavers outside. Pterodactyl? No. Yeah, no, it's raining giraffes and bears outside. It's raining, it's raining a lot outside. Anyway, so my engine building room, which is right over there, no good. So we're inside today, and uh, this is the reason why I'm tucked up right against my garage door, and that's because, you know, I'm a little short on room. So we got the race car over there, which is covered in all of my stuff for other projects. And I don't know if you can see it. There's a turbo right there. Pretty cool. And then today, the 66 just became uh, my ceiling. For a light. All right, for this step, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some actual precision measuring tools. I know, if you watch this channel, you're probably wondering, Steve, why do you even have that? You don't use this. And as it turns out, when I spend a bunch of money on an engine, this is one thing I actually will spend money on. I know, it's very hypocritical. Poor man can't, can't be rich. Anyway, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a micrometer and then we're gonna use a dial bore from here. So, all right, welcome to the break room here at American Nostalgia Garage. Got our crank on my son's little tykes table. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my micrometer and I'm gonna put it over my number one, cause that's what we're gonna do first, new number one. I'm gonna put it over my number one main journal which is what we're measuring right now. All right, now you want to do that with as minimal damage as possible, so don't destroy the crankshaft like I just did. So I'm not going to get into measuring, you know, doing the micrometer. That's a video in itself. But what I will say is we ended up getting a 2-inch 558, which is what they're supposed to be. So we're right there. Now we've got our measurement, 2-inch 558, what it's supposed to be. 2-inch 558 and, and some change. The, the, the 10 thousandths place doesn't really matter. It's close it's good for us it's good so this part requires either a vice or a partner or extreme hand-eye coordination 
which is what we're going to use. Which is odd because we don't have any of that. So, so what we're going to do here is we're going to put the dial bore gauge in the, the mic, and then I'm going to zero on the the dial of the gauge itself. I'm going to zero it out. So let me explain what I just did. This is our crankshaft measurement, the measurement of the main on our crankshaft. This, now that I've zeroed it to this measurement, this, when it reads zero, is exactly this measurement. When we're on our zero mark, this, this style board gauge will read exactly this measurement. You want to have oil clearance when you put your crankshaft in. There's got to be a couple thousands. Usually, there's a whole bunch of rules to this, but usually you want to have like two to three thousands, maybe a little more if it's a little worn out or whatever, maybe a little less if you have a racing engine. So the point is, what we need to do is find out the relationship between this measurement, which is a crankshaft, and the bore itself. How many thousands difference is it? This doesn't take measurements. What this does is it gives you relative um, proximities between whatever you're referencing, which is this, the crankshaft, and the bore itself. So now when I place this in the hole, it's going to read on the dial a certain number of thousandths of an inch. That's going to be our oil clearance for our crankshaft. So let's do it. All right, now this tool is spring-loaded. It's got like a little pin there. When I press the pin, it moves the gauge. You're going to throw that up in there. Now, I don't know how focused this is, but you see right there? See right there, that's our measurement. It doesn't go any further than that. And that is two thousandths. So we're good. Number one is good. So that shows you the reference between our number one crankshaft main journal and the bore on the block. We have about two thousandths. Uh, it's good enough. It's, I'm not gonna get into like machining anything. It's close enough. So I would probably rather have like two and a half thousandths, but two thousandths is fine. I'm just going to bang out the rest of them because you don't want to watch me do this a bunch of times. I don't even want to do this a bunch of times. It's boring. So I'm going to do the rest of them and then we'll get you updated. All right. Here's what I got uh, after measuring everything. Number one we get, did together it was two thousandths. Number two was two and a half thousandths. Number three was two and a half thousandths. Number four was two thousandths. And number five was two point two thousandths. So everything's pretty much in spec where I want it to be. Uh, this is not, I'm not an engine builder. I do this, you know, pretty frequently actually, but I'm not an engine builder. So this is just going to uh, avoid any critical engine clearance issues. This is close enough. Well, if you don't, we are going to start installing stuff. I might be catching you by surprise here. So we got a set of forged pistons. We're going to set everything up. Uh, reason being, my torque wrench is broken and I got to get another one now that has angle. I could do one of those like twisty clock looking angle things, but I'm not that smart. So I'm just going to get a torque wrench that tells me when to stop. So what we're going to do in the meantime is set everything up. We're going to do our pistons and our piston rings. Now I bought piston rings that are not file fit, but my file doesn't know the difference. My file doesn't know I'm not supposed to be filing these. So these piston rings will have to mind their business and I'll do what I want. Anyway, we got a set of uh, Summit Pro LS, whatever, pistons, and here are the suggestions on ring gap. Our, the way ring gap works is it's the, if your piston ring is a ring, but it's open at the end, there's a little gap, so, you know, so you can get it on the piston. That gap is important because all different types of pistons and different types of engine configurations, uh, that everything's going to expand at different rates, horsepower, nitrous, blower, naturally aspirated, high power, low power, blah, blah, blah. So, what they do is they give you a sheet, and it tells you what the ring end gap factor is going to be. So, right here, street nat naturally aspirated, the, the ring end gap factor is going to be four thousandths. Now, that's not four thousandths of opening. That's four thousandths per inch of bore. Now, we have a four-inch bore, so four, uh, four thousandths would be sixteen thousandths uh, on the top ring. You know, and then the second ring is you, you follow, you know... The pattern here but the top ring is very very important so that's why they give you this so ours is says 16 again these are drop-in rings we're going to make sure that it's 16 or close and if it's not we're going to file them all right so what i did is i don't have uh a 
ring squaring tool, so I made one. I took a piston, I put a number two ring on there. You could see it. What I'm gonna do is, each one of these rings has um, an indicator that makes it the top. This one says top. I'm gonna throw this in the number one hole by hand, just at the top, just so that it's inside the, the bore without getting my glove caught in there. I'm gonna take my piston, I'm gonna push it down until the ring that's on the piston hits the, the deck. And that's gonna leave me with a gap, which now I'm gonna measure with a set of ninja fans. I don't know if you can make it out on camera, but there is our gap right there. So 16 is the minimum end gap that they're saying for these pistons. So I'm gonna find number 16. That's our 16 feeler gauge. It slides in there, it's kinda loose. Let's see, can I do, let's try 18. 18 fits. Twenty fits. Let's try twenty-one. All right, I can't get twenty-one in there. So our ring end gap right now on our top ring on number one piston is twenty thousandths. Now I said sixteen over there, but that's that's just what they're requesting as a minimum. And these are just just suggestions. This is twenty thousandths, and this is going to be good to go. Now remember, you have eight cylinders i hope and you have two rings on each piston that have to be checked for gap the oil ring you don't really have to check just make sure that it doesn't butt up um or so you don't have you know you don't have issues what i will say is these non-file fit rings are good they're convenient for stuff like this where it's not super critical because you can just throw it in and saves a bunch of time on filing it which is a pain in the butt but if you needed to be very precise on something, like if I wanted it to be 16, uh, it's too big already. And you can't unfile them, right? So I'm stuck with this. Now I'm plenty happy with this, but just saying. It's consideration. I'm going to do the rest of these, and then we'll get cracking with uh, assembling our pistons. All right, so just wanted to do a little bit of a teaching point. Just, you know, for guys that don't know, you know, might help out. I did all of our ring end gaps. Uh, and our second ring end gaps on our uh, second compression ring. On this one, it was 25 thousandths. On the rest, it was like 21 to 23-ish. This one was big. So what I did is this one was a little bit tight. This one was a little loose. So I took the number, the second compression ring here and the second compression ring here and swapped them. As it turns out, the gap on this is just bigger. Something to do with the probably the damage in this one cylinder. It is what it is, but it's close enough, so it's going to have to work. Sometimes you can get away with that, though, so it's important to mention. You know, if you have one that's tight in the back and one that's loose here, if you switch it, you know, it, it might work out because it just might be the ring itself. It turns out it's not the ring, it's the block. But we knew that because this thing has been stored underwater for the last 60 years. So now that we have all the rings done and the end gaps checked, verified, we've got to set up each of the pistons. The pistons have an arrow on it. I don't know if you can see that. And that's going to face towards the front of the engine. So what I've got to do now is set up four pointing this way. And on the other side, make sure that the four point the same direction. The reason that's important is because the valve reliefs are not symmetrical. You can see this one's bigger for the intake valve. So these, if they get turned this way, and then the small valve relief is where the big valve is, and you don't want that to happen. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take each one of the sets of rings, load it onto a piston, and then I'm gonna throw a mark on it for which piston it is. All right, these are next. I have them all preloaded with bearings and torqued down. Now what we've gotta do is the same thing as we did with the main bearings. We are going to get a measurement off of the crankshaft journal and then dial bore the inside of this. So I'm not gonna go through it again. You guys saw it, you know what to do. Same difference, you don't have to put it in the engine, you can hold it. What I will say about the connecting rods, it's kind of important, and we'll go over this when we install them also. If you look at the connecting rod, see how there's like a machine surface here? It's kind of a chamfer, they call it. I'm gonna spin the rod around. You notice this one doesn't have it. 
These rods are actually, they don't just go everywhere. They don't go anywhere you want. That big chamfer always has to go against the crank. All right, we got all the rods mic'd out. Every single one of them was uh, two and a half thousandths, which is phenomenal. Good job, China. Don't get mad at me, they're Chinese rods. But now that we've done that, now we've located each one of the rods belong to a cylinder. We have pistons that each belong to a cylinder. Now we gotta mate that up. Now guys, you might be saying, oh, you got all two and a half thousandths on each, each one and everything checked out. Why did you even bother doing it? Well, it's accountability, you know? Because, I mean, listen, when this thing grenades itself on first startup, you know, you want to be able to storm in the house, pick up that phone, and call the guy that's responsible for it. So what you do is you call your voicemail so you can hear yourself talk and you yell at yourself. Make sure you leave yourself a, a long message with a lot of obscenities. And then you listen to it back, you know, later on, make you feel better. All right, so we're just going to install all the corresponding pistons on the connecting rod. So we got a rotating assembly to install. And we're cooking with peanut oil here. Thankfully, we're done with this. I could put all my NASA moon equipment away. Um, my brain hurts using all this stuff. All right, I got all of our pistons in installed on our rods. I made sure to pay attention to where the chamfer goes. On the number one bank, the chamfer on the rod goes forward against the crank. Flat side goes against the other rod. On the number two bank, the chamfer goes towards the rear against the crank and the flat side goes towards the other rod in the middle. Uh, these get installed with these little sir clips in there. Uh, I didn't show you that because I want guys to be able to watch this with their kids and I would absolutely need to change the rating of the channel if uh, I showed you that. What I will say is that the best way to do it is to use a small pick with a right angle. They sell them at uh, Harbor Freight. Reason being, they're sharp so they can get into the little groove that you need to get the circlip in. And also they have a uh, high chance of you slipping off and stabbing into your finger and needing to make a trip to the hospital. And that's good because if you slip off and need to go to the hospital, then you can stop having to do this for the rest of the night. Bad news is, then you got to do it with a band-aid or stitches on your finger. You know, can't, can't win them all, you know? All right, it's another day. See how nice it is? Enough playing Bill Nye the Science Guy. We got to get a crank in this thing, and I want to get some rods and pistons loaded into this thing, and then see how far we can get. Still got to work on the blue car today, so I'm going to break time up today. Anyway, got no time to waste. Let's get a crank in this thing. I've never actually used this one before, but it's pretty good. Side note, make sure you get the sides of your thrust bearing. Side note, no pun intended. is laid into place it's not torqued down yet the mains are all loose fight the urge to turn it I want to turn it too I really do but you don't want to wipe all the oil off of it and it's really not totally perfectly a circle yet right now until it's all torqued down so you just you don't want to run the risk of maybe spinning it over and getting something in there or scratching the crank so just wait till it's torqued there's also a, a couple different styles that guys use to do this uh, I'm going to follow the sequence where we do all the middles or the inner bolts and then the outer bolts after. Uh, these have to be torqued down to a certain pound foot of torque and then torque to an angle. Uh, I've got to look it up. All right, I'm going to take all of our inner bolts here and here and all the way down. I'm going to take those all down to 15. Then I'm going to take all of our outers down to 15. And then I'm going to take our inners down to 80 degrees. And then our outers are going to go down to 51 degrees. I'll show you what that looks like. But you have to watch because it's going to be fast on time lapse. All 
All right, so before I go on and torquing anything else, I'm going to give the crank a couple hits from the front with a, a soft rubber mallet and a couple hits from the back. Kind of bounce it back and forth, and there's a reason for it. It's because it is thrust bearing. So the deal with the thrust bearing is the thrust bearing is two halves like this with little collars on the side. And that's for the end play of the crankshaft. The crankshaft actually moves uh, front and back in the engine a little bit. But there's got to be a bearing that stops the thrust of the crankshaft. This is really important in stick cars. It's not as important in automatic cars, although you should always do this, is set that thrust bearing in its center. So basically the reason we're smacking it with the, the hammer is basically you're pushing the crank all the way one way and you're pushing it all the way the other way in the direct, the furthest directions it's going to go in. And then when you do that, you push the, both of those halves as far as they'll go this way. And then you're going to take it and you're going to push it as far as it goes this way. And you basically set up those two boundaries, the two maximums. Uh, with some engines, you can take a, a screwdriver and pry it back and forth, kind of the same thing. A lot of times you'll take a screwdriver and you'll, before you crank a, the, the, all the main bolts down, you'll shove a screwdriver in there just to push the crank forward and then do your final torque. I'm not going to do that here because it's an automatic, so I'm just going to set it up and then torque it. But the reason you would do that is because, especially the, in the forward direction, is because the forward direction is a little bit more important only because the transmission actually is what pushes the crankshaft forward and back and it usually pushes it forward it won't push it backwards so forward is more important to have that thrust bearing section lined up but we're going to do it because it's important and it's one quick easy step so All right, it's literally that easy. All right, now we're gonna go through the sequence again, except now, instead of a torque value, we're gonna do a number of degrees of revolution. So I'm gonna start in our middle. Each one of the middles has to go down to an additional 80 degrees of turn. So that's almost a quarter turn. Um, I have a special torque wrench that does angle. That's upside down, so it's not eight, it's 80. And uh, you can do this without that. There's a bunch of other tools you can use, like a little, dial with a pointer. Um, I've done it before like that. I don't like it because it makes me scared. All right, learned my lesson when I lost track three times, so I had to start over. I painted each one as I did it. So a little help, helpful reminder. I do this every single time that I uh, build an engine. I do the same thing where I forget if I did one and then I get nervous and then I have to, I have to paint it. So this is a common thing for me. These outer ones now are already at 15 pounds. Now they've got to go an additional 51 degrees. All right, something that I mentioned that I didn't mention that I did off camera is I put the uh, side main cap bolts in. They get torqued down to eight foot, 18 foot pounds each. Uh, very easy to forget, but try not to if you can. Uh, they get a little bit of a dab of silicone underneath, so don't forget that either because they'll leak. I have dinner bill. All right, I got my old friend stitches out. I uh, bet you can't guess why I call it that. Anyway, if you watch the Home Shopping Network at any time in your life, then you've probably seen those Jinsu knives. There's no question, this is the sharpest thing on planet Earth. So if you want to uh, kill somebody or whatever, this is the tool. Anyway, we're going to use this thing to put our pistons in. Just prepping here, just wanted to show you guys something that came up while I was doing it. If you ever you got your rods and you can't get the cap off of it, Unscrew the bolt, give a couple taps, they come right off. So if you're an engine builder, maybe skip through this part here. This is the last time you're going to see these pistons, so 
Make sure you get the arrow pointing in the right direction. Make sure you got your sir clips in there. Make sure the chamfer on the crank is going to face the right direction. On the, in this case, is going to be in the back. And uh, give yourself an opportunity to, to offset your rings. They do spin, so this isn't you know imperative. But if I don't say it, some engine builder is going to want to kill me. So this takes two seconds, so you might as well do it anyway. Got our piston loaded and oriented in here. Now I'm just going to push it down. Making sure none of the rings get caught. Now I'm going to guide it down gently while locating it on the crankshaft. No, it looks like a war zone in here, but we got the entire rotating assembly. In. So now I'm going to flip it up, upside down, and I'm going to torque all the rods to 68 foot-pounds. I want to wash my hands before I touch my new tool, so cut check. Cut check. Good. All right, boys and girls, it's another day, and we got to get a cam in this thing. Rotating assembly's done. Might be wondering why it's upside down, and that's because this is how I want to mount it in the engine bay. I'm just kidding. No, I want to be able to feed the cam in through the bottom, and uh, I don't know if I'll ever even be able to get in there anymore, but no, we're not going to take a hammer to our, my brand new engine. Well, brand new to us. No, thank you. Just like his old man. All right, we're going to lube up our cam, and we're going to stuff this thing in here, get a timing set on it, and then we are going to... We don't really have to degree the cam, but I am going to check it, and I'll show you. All right. Cam is installed. I got the bat wing in there. You know, it looks like, you know, just look at it. And uh, I mentioned that we got the Chop Monster cam. And uh, this came with a guarantee that it would eat your kids in the middle of the night. Okay, no it didn't, and I don't want to get sued for slander, so please, you know, all your parents at home that have had a rough day with your kids, it doesn't make your kids disappear. Anyway, moving on. Got our cam installed. I actually preliminarily, SAT word, installed our crank timing gear. I've got the rest of our timing set over here on my other workbench, which is my welder. And uh, I didn't actually have the three bolts that go into the cam, but I did have some timing cover bolts, one, two, and three, and they fit good. Just going to get our cam gear installed and our timing chain installed and then we're going to go through the process of how you check uh, verify top dead center and then we're going to uh, make sure that the intake center line is where it's supposed to be. So the timing set we're using has offset bushings and what it does is it goes in the one that would be on the pin on the back of that crank which is right here and you can see that's a perfect circle. Some of these other offset ones, what it does is it offsets the dowel in the cam down or up in that hole. And what will happen is the cam will have a certain amount of turning like this within that dowel that will give it its timing. So we just want to make sure that what they say is supposed to be installed straight up with a uh, 106 intake center line. We want to make sure that that's valid. All right, guys, pay close attention because this is commonly confused, and it is really confusing. So first thing I have up here is a piston bridge, which is basically a piece of metal that has a little stopper. And what that does is it gives the piston something to press up against. So what we're going to do is instead of looking for the center of a circle, you know, imagine trying to find the, set, the exact center of this circle, right? Instead of doing that, what we're going to do is find out when this piston touches that bridge we're going to find the two points on each side of the hill at the same distance say here and here and then we're going to find out what the sweep is in between the two and do math no good but we're going to do math to find out what the exact center is so it'd be like getting pick a number zero and sixty all right there's sixty degrees in between zero and and sixty well, 30 would be the middle, but there you have to do more to do that. So anyway, what I have is I have a little pointer set up on the block. Kind of doesn't matter 
where it points right now, as long as it's perpendicular and it's not pointing like this way, it'll be hard to read, perpendicular to the wheel, then you have your piston bridge and you have your degree wheel. Now I'm gonna turn it until my piston touches the piston bridge up here. If you look closely, you probably see the piston come up. All right, I'm touching, that's it. I can't go further. I don't know if you can see the piston is touching this bridge. And now that's 17 degrees. Yeah, 17. So I wanna make a small mark right there. That's our number one point. Now I'm gonna run it the other side of the hill and back it all the way up. And now I'm touching again, okay? And now I've got 30, 30 degrees. So I'm pointing right at 30, I'll make a little mark. All right. Now here's where it can get really confusing. You're not really doing the middle of those two marks. So you see 17 here, my 30 mark here. Well, I kind of have this going over the zero mark. So if you just did 13 and 70 and you average those two, you'd probably end up somewhere up here um, because 17 is here and 30 is here. You'd end up somewhere in here, but their sweep is really from here to here. So it's actually across zero. So you gotta make sure you add those numbers in. So you have 30 degrees plus 17 degrees, that's 47 degrees. Then what you have to do is now take your two numbers added together, the full sweep, and then you divide it by two. Uh, in this case, it would be 23 and a half. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the 23 and a half and divide it, or excuse me, I'm going to subtract it from the 30. Uh, if you had both whole numbers, you could divide it, but because I'm kind of crossing over zero, I'm just going to make the difference. So 30 degrees, subtract our 23 and a half, which would get us halfway down. That brings us to six and a half degrees, which is right five Six would be here, a half would be like right in the middle there. I'll put a dot so we know. Okay, now here's another thing that people forget. You have to take this bridge off, otherwise you're not gonna be able to get to that number. So I'm going to swing it around now to our six and a half degrees. Before I get there, I'm gonna loosen my piston bridge and that's gonna be our top dead center. All right, now here we are at six and a half degrees. You can see I made my little mark. This would be five, that's six and a half. And look at the piston. It's right at top dead center. So this is a perfect top dead center. Now that we found top dead center though, I could take, instead of loosening the wheel and turning the wheel, I could just take this pointer because it's really a reference point and I just point it right at zero. Now, now we're at zero. Magic, right? All right, if you could tell it's dark outside, took a little break for dinner. Anyway, we're back at it. So let's uh, start over here. Let's, we're gonna go back and reestablish our max lift. So I remember, yeah, we're set at zero there. So we're good. All right, so now we're gonna go to our 50 thousands before max lift. Actually hit it dead on the nose. We got 59. Oh no, we got 62, there's max lift, and there's our 50 thousands again. And we have 153. So when we do that math, 153 plus 62 equals, divide that by two to get our center, 107 and a half. So it's within a degree and a half of what the cam card said. Uh, we'll leave it there. A degree and a half isn't really worth chasing, at least not in this capacity, in this build. So straight up, this thing was pretty close. If you're thinking, hey guy, why is the cylinder head on? You didn't show us any of that stuff. Well, I'm actually checking piston to valve clearance real quick, just to make sure, because the pistons that I have down here in the short block are flat tops and uh, they come out of the hole just a smidge so just checking so i'm basically going to turn it through its motion 
while turning the crank with the other hand. You can't see that, but... Okay, we're good. You want to have, uh, I don't know, about 80 on the intake and about 100 thousandths on the exhaust. The exhaust reason being is it grows because of the heat, so. All right, here's why you check everything, because I have to do a valve spring upgrade on this engine because of the camera running and all that stuff. So I went to go height mic, which is just this micrometer that expands as you turn it, and you know, you can see what it does. You put the retainer on there and you get a height. The height that came off was like one inch 950 or something, almost two inches. That was with these stock looking springs from whatever rebuilder redid these heads. Okay, so that's number one, right? The springs that are going in this need to be installed at approximately one inch 780 or so. And that's from Michigan Motorsports who sells the springs. They're Brian Tooley Racing Springs and that's what they're supposed to be installed at. That's what they said. So, the distance from here to here, even with the retainer, when I put the spring in with the retainer and got our height, it's 1 inch 855 here and 1 inch 840 here. So that's uh, 75 thousandths difference here in height and 60 thousandths here in height. So that's a problem because that's not close enough to our targeted spring height. And if I had to put these, put it in at these two heights and just slap the spring in here, the springs would end up being soft, which means they wouldn't have the right spring rate at the lift that we need them to in order to worry about like, you know, floating the valves and whatnot. So that's why you check this. It's just slapping springs and stuff that you don't know about or you're not sure got to be very careful guys so make sure you check this stuff all right we ran into another snag with our cylinder heads as you saw i have to get some shims there's no place to get shims right now and i have cylinder head shims or valve spring shims but they're for a small block chevy and those aren't gonna fit so got to order the right ones so that puts us back another day or two to get them here in the meantime i got to do a trunnion upgrade on these so the trunnion is this piece where they pivot on in the middle you see it's kind of got a limit to it and uh, also these have needle bearings in them that are tend to fail they actually don't fail <laughs> in stock fashion but when you're doing what we all like to do these can fail and you don't want needle bearings shooting around your engine so we're gonna press these out and press in a new bearing which is a captured roller bearing and it will has 360 degrees of rotation and it's not gonna explode in your engine. So the rocker arm has this like little thing with wings on one side and the other side it doesn't have it. So the wings is the thing you're gonna put down so you can uh, have something to push against. I'm just doing this with a shop press. You do need a shop press or a vise or something. And basically what I have is a socket to catch the old bearing, a socket to push the old bearing through I'm gonna press it through, and it, that's it, it just popped. There's the old trunnion. Now we have a, a rocker with nothing in it. They give you these two install washers. We're gonna take one cap, which has these little plastic plugs in it, just leave those in for now. All right, we're gonna push the one top cap in. All right, there's one. Then we're gonna take our trunnion, we're gonna push it through the middle, like this, push it through the middle, Pops the plastic cap out the back. Now there's room for you to put that C-clip that comes in the kit. Now we've got the other side. We have to put a bearing in there. So we'll grab another bearing, put that on top. And then we're going to press that down. And there it is. It really is pretty easy. Now, I'm going to do all of them and then go back and put all the circlips on each one of them. All right, we're back at it again today. We're going to actually fix our cylinder head dilemma. And we're going to get these things mounted. So, did the height mic. What I ended up getting is 1 inch 840 or 1 inch 838. The fix is to get the correct size shims. In this case, this needs about a 60 thousandths because we need a 1 inch... 780 thousandths installed height. So I threw that shim on there, our spring locator, throw our height mic back on there. 
All right, I don't know if you can make it out, but with our 60,000 shim in there, we're right at one inch 775, so one inch 775 thousandths, which is within five thousandths of our targeted installed height. So we're perfect here. We've got to do that all the way through both cylinder heads, and then uh, we can install these pups. And hopefully you're still with us. I mean, this is a long video. If you're still with us, please subscribe to the channel. Maybe drop a like. Thanks. All right, we got our cylinder head, all the valve springs done, ready to go. We got them specced correctly. We got our lifter trays in with our lifters. We let our lifters sit in some oil for a little while. Lifter trays sunk right in, tightened our bolts, ready to put a cylinder head on. So uh, let's do it. All right, I chased all of our holes. We're gonna use a multiple layer steel gasket, head gasket. It's got a label for the front on the LS engine. There is, I think it's eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight that are these extra long bolts. There's two kind of medium bolts on each end inside the, where the valve cover, where the valve springs are. And then there's one, two, three, four, five like M8 bolts. This has kind of a funny torque sequence compared to like a small block Chevy. It's again, degrees. So these are all torque to yield, which means these actually stretch and uh, they're really like one time use, so you can get away with more than one. But I don't want to get killed, so maybe you didn't hear what I just said. Some guy's crazy about that. So the extra long bolts are gonna go down here. Every one of these bolts is, every one of the bolts is called blind hole, which means it doesn't go into a water jacket. So no need for a sealant, but there is some sort of, you know, I guess sealant or something on there. Uh, we are gonna put ultra torque uh, torquing lube on each one of these and we're gonna go through the, the sequence so the longer bolts is 22 foot-pounds I wrote it down somewhere on a box that so doesn't look like I'm cheating but I think it was 22 foot-pounds on the first step then 90 degrees on the second step and 90 degrees on the third step and then the smaller like medium tor sort of bolts are 22 foot-pounds 90 degrees on the second step and then 50 degrees on the third step and then the M8s across the top, those are just, uh, I think they're 22 foot-pounds, whatever. So let me get this torqued on. All right, we really have to get this thing done. Need an oil pump, valley cover, some other odds and ends, get some tins on this thing, maybe an intake. We're very close. Uh, I don't feel like shimming this thing, which is really like the right way to do it, so I'm gonna do it the um, wrong way. Although this way does work. Just put your engine assembly lube in there and you just keep turning it. You'll feel it kind of take all that oil in there and take it up and get it into the gears. I'm going to put a little oil on our snout. Once it's on to center it, again, I'm going to do the easiest thing to do, which is just turn this thing over twice. But now I'm going to tighten these down, I think, to its uh, 18 foot-pounds. All right, I want to put a rear main seal on this thing and put the cover on with the gasket. But the barbell has to be changed. This is this little restrictor thing, diverter, oil, flim-flam, you know, doza what's it. And uh, if you watch this channel, you already know what I'm about to do. That is a self-tapper. And, yep, of course we're going to use that because that's what we do here. Just gonna put a needle nose on there, yank it right out. And there it is. Needle nose to the rescue once again in this garage. So we'll get a new one in there, we'll get the new barbell in there, we'll get the new rear cover on with the rear main seal. All right, it's slid on. I'm gonna get all the bolts in and then I'm gonna feel to make sure that it's flush down here with the oil pan rail here and then uh, we can lock it down. All right, we got some valve covers on it. Gotta get two bolts. I got the front cover on it with the new seal, but it's loose. I'm gonna put the balancer on first and then tighten it, let the balancer kind of uh, align it and self-center it. So I'm gonna flip it upside down. Gotta put the oil pickup tube and the oil pan on. And they're almost done. There's a couple different styles of pickup tube. Depends on what kind of shoulder you have here. They'll show you the three different types. In our case, 
uh, we're going to use the green o-ring, but it looks like you either use green or black. They give you two. So just be sure to check. Got our pickup tube installed. Of course, uh, I initially forgot to get our windage tray, but uh, I got it on there before I messed up twice. So that's on. Pickup tube is on. I'm going to use the proper tool, which of course is a hammer. And a dusty wood block. got her done. Oh. Well, not really. I'm not mounting this actually because it's got to come off in order to go in the truck. And uh, if you were paying really close attention, we actually never put rockers in here. But there's a reason for that. I'm not trying to cheat you. Uh, I'm actually waiting for push rods uh, to come in the mail and I don't want to wait to get this video up. You guys really don't need to see me putting push rods in. I mean, look at all the cool stuff you got to watch. Anyway, this video was a lot of work. Uh, I do appreciate you guys if you made it all the way through. If you did make it all the way through, please consider subscribing to the channel. Uh, I've got a lot more stuff to come, and this is going in our Blazer, or it's a Jimmy uh, Project monster truck. So, as always, thank you for watching. American Nostalgia Garage, out.